You're going through a stage that you've never been in before. You're at the stage where you promise I'm with you and you're with me and nobody else. It's just me and you, baby. Me and you. You're somewhere where you've never been before. And then, if you're fortunate enough to hang there long enough, engagement comes along. Now you have a fiancé that you're saying, I'm going to be committed to you for the rest of my life. I don't know about you, but when I first got engaged, I'd never been engaged before. It's a little different place, different experience. Then all of a sudden you go from the dating to the engagement to marriage. Now you're married. How many woke up married one day realizing, I've never been here before? You see, years ago, we used to take marriage seriously. We made a covenant, not only with one another, but we made a covenant with God. And in front of God's people, and we'd stand in front of the church and make a commitment and a covenant, a covenant that says this will not be broken. I promise you, till death takes us, I'll be yours. That was the way we used to do it in old time. Hello? Hello? We're someplace now where we have never been before. Where kids today think nothing of marriage and go outside of marriage. Doing things that only married couples should be doing. Kind of like nothing to worry about. Everything's okay. The church, if you'll bear with me, I'll, I'll get to where I'm going with this. But all of that comes into effect into the church. Now, the church is in a position where we've never been before. We've got couples coming in, and I have them in my church. I'm, I know what I'm talking about. I love them to death. I don't condemn them. I love them. Only God can fix it. I can. They'll come in, but it amazes me that several years ago in the church that a sinner would be condemned to come in and act holy knowing that they were living in sin. I'm not here to condemn or to preach condemnation, but the Bible says that if there is sin in our life, God cannot have an effect in our life. It's what the Word of God says. But we're in a place now where people and couples come in, they're living together, they're having children together, and they're doing things that are ungodly, and will stand and worship God just like anybody else in the church. We're where we've never been before. When you get married, you find yourself in a position that you've never been before. You wake up thinking, I think I'm going to go do something. But you realize you've got a wife that says, no, you're not. You're going to do what I want you to do. Yes, dear. Notice how quiet the men are getting. It's a different. I remember when I got married, I took her to a wonderful hotel place for a honeymoon. And uh, things didn't go quite well on the honeymoon. Because it's like you try to surprise her where you take them. Be a surprise. I found out that night, don't ever try to surprise your wife. Wives don't like surprises. Now, they like them if they know about them and they're in charge of them. Come on, ladies, are you out there? It's a good thing. The second thing that I made, my second mistake that I did was I told her that we were going to move to the great state of West Virginia and start a church. Eh, wrong. We were both born and raised Buckeyes, so she didn't like that idea. I was in a position that I'd never been in before. We'd lived with a friend of ours when we got married because we were evangelists and traveling, so we didn't have our own home. We were privileged to stay with a friend of ours who was a widow. 
And after uh, several months of staying with her, I woke up one morning and my wife looked at me and said, I want my own house. Did anybody else ever go through that? Men, where you at? Something amazing that a woman wants her own house. I said, well, what's wrong with where we're at? I want my own house. I want my own dishes. I want to be able to hang my pictures on the wall. Somewhere where I had, am I bringing memories back? Been somewhere where I'd never been before. And Please hear me. I, I don't want to sound negative. I, we've celebrated our 32nd anniversary, I think it was this year, 32 years of marriage. I'm reminded of the old man that was married a long time ago, and they were celebrating his 75th wedding anniversary, and they were both living. The interviewer asked him, he said, how can you contribute such a long marriage with your wife? He said, well, we agreed right away that if we ever, ever got into any arguments, I would go for a long walk in the woods. And he said, I stay in the woods a lot. Got a witness right over there. I don't mean to get carnal, but I love this story. I got to tell you this one. We're talking about anniversaries, I, I heard a, a man was in his backyard just sitting on the swing back there just crying his eyes out neighbor come over and said what's the matter with you he said i'm celebrating my 25th anniversary today well man what are you crying about he said you should be excited about that 25 years he said you know when i was sparking my wife when we were dating he said her daddy caught us behind the barn sparking for young people that don't know what that is was kissing and making out and said, he come to me and said, boy, I have authority with the law in this town and I'll see to it that you'll marry my daughter or for the next 25 years you'll be in jail. He said, I was just sitting there thinking I could have been a free man today. Just a thought. <laughs> boy, the men are really chewing that one over right there. We've been through some changes. We've been to places we've never been before. We're married now, and then all of a sudden, children come along. Oh, Lord. Much less in-laws, now you got children. How many remember when you first brought your first baby home? How many remember that? That was scary, wasn't it? You remember that? How many remember that was a scary moment when you first brought your first baby home? When we brought Dennis home, I mean, it was carrying him like a crate of eggs. Laid him in our room every five minutes looking to see if he was breathing or not. I mean, we just never been there before. You're just like, what do you do with this? He don't fit on a motorcycle. Hello? Now your life's changed because you've got responsibility with taking a, a child into your life. Today's generation has the children, don't marry, gives them to grandma and grandpa and says, thank you very much. Help me out a little bit. Still love me? I may never get to come back, but I'm going to have a good time today. Children come in. Your life change. You've never been there before having children. And I, I found out that when you have your first child, then you're very protective. People want to hold him. Well, I don't know. I don't. Have you ever held a baby before? before? I don't, is your hands clean? I really don't know if you should hold my baby. You're just protective. Then the more you have... The easier to, yeah, take, God, take them, yes, take them. <laughs> Y'all been down that road. Things change, and then they grow up. They start talking about things that you're not ready for because you've not been there before. They start looking at you and talking about drugs and alcohol and their peers around them. They start coming home saying, I want piercings. I want tattoos. I'm thinking about doing this. and I'm thinking about doing that. Some of them come home. The, the daughters come home and say, Mom, I've got to tell you something that I'm pregnant. The son comes home and says, Dad, I've got to tell you something. I've been stealing money from your account because I'm addicted to drugs. I need help. 
They come in now and they're confused with their sexuality. They don't know whether a man should be with a woman or a man should be with a man or a woman with a man or a woman with a woman. The devil's got them completely blinded. They're in an area that they've never been before and we've never been there before. Then God forbid that if sickness would come into the family, when your spouse gets sick and your, your husband or your wife becomes ill to the place where you can no longer take care of them by yourself and you need help, that's a place many seniors reach in their life and they've never been there before and they don't know how to quite handle that. What do you do when tragedy strikes your home and somebody becomes handicapped? Now they're wheelchair bound or maybe they're bedridden or they're blind or they're deaf or they become crippled or maybe you've got a Down syndrome child now into your home. We've come into the place where we've never been before and sometimes, God forbid, some of our families lose the spouse and a child by death. Never been there before. How do I deal with this? How do I get there? Everybody says God is all I need, but sometimes I need a little bit more than that. There's a man by the name of Solomon in 1 Kings chapter 3 that finds himself in the exact same situation. Solomon is married to Pharaoh's daughter. The Bible says that he's building a house for him and his family. He's not only in the process of building a house for him and his family, he's in the process of building the house of the Lord. He's not only in the process of building a house for his family and a house for the family of God, he's also in the process of building a wall that surrounds the city of Jerusalem. And at, through all of this process, he has taken the time, the Bible says, to continue to go and offer burnt offerings to the Lord. And at this particular time in his life, the Bible said he has already offered a thousand burnt offerings to God. Here's what happens in the story. 1 Kings chapter 3 and verse 5. In Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God asked, or God said, Ask what I shall give thee. Oh, that's powerful. How many would love to hear God say that today? Ask me anything today. And Solomon said, Thou hast showed unto thy servant David my father great mercy according as he walked before thee in truth and in righteousness and in uprightness of heart with thee. And thou hast kept for him this great kindness that thou hast given him a son to sit on his throne as it is this day. And now, O Lord my God, thou hast made thy servant king instead of David my father, and I am but a little child, meaning I don't know how to do anything. I'm in a position where I don't know what I'm doing because I've never been here before. I know not how to go out or come in. Verse 8 said, And thy servant is in the midst of thy people, which thou hast chosen a great people, that cannot be numbered nor counted for multitude. Give therefore thy servant an understanding heart to judge thy people, that I may discern between good and bad, for who is able to judge this thy so great a people? Look at verse 10. And the speech pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this thing. God said unto him, Because thou hast asked this thing, and hast not asked for thyself long life, neither hast asked for riches, nor asked the life of thine enemies, but hast asked for thyself understanding to discern judgment, behold, I have done according to thy words. Lo, I have given thee a wise and understanding spirit so that there was none like thee before thee, neither after thee shall any arise like thee unto thee. And I have also given thee that which thou hast not asked for. 
both riches and honor, so that there shall not be any among the kings like unto thee all thy days. And if thou wilt walk in my ways to keep my statutes and my commandments as thy father David did walk, then I will lengthen thy days. Look at verse 15. And Solomon woke up to realize it was a dream. Can I stop right here and tell you that God can turn your nightmares into a dream? God can turn your nightmares into a dream. And he came to Jerusalem and stood before the ark of the covenant of the Lord and offered up a burnt offering or burnt offerings and offered peace offerings and made a feast to all his servants. There's somebody in this house today that you're in a place where you've never been before and you don't know how you're going to get through it. But God has sent me your way to help you get through it. Father, in the name of Jesus, for the next few moments, I need your help. God, I need you to touch me Anoint me like you've never anointed me before. Anoint the ears, the ears to receive. I give you glory and honor for the life and the lives that you're about to change in this tabernacle today. I give it to you in Jesus' name. And everybody shouted amen and amen. The Bible says when it talks about the statement to ask, it simply talks about prayer. The term prayer means to ask or to make a request, or to de a desire, or to desire, or to call to one's aid, asking God for help. One's ability to speak to God by the voice of man. When I think of that, that amazes me. How that God created us in such a way that just from my lips, that all I have to do is call upon His name. And the Bible says that His ears are open to my prayer, and his eyes are upon me. Just the sound of my voice stops all of heaven and grabs the attention of Almighty God when I holler for help and pray for an intercessory on anybody's behalf. God stops with his undivided attention and says, I hear one of my sheep that is in trouble calling. They're somewhere where they're not supposed to be. They're somewhere where they've never been before. And I'm going to take my rod and my staff and comfort them and lead them back into the fold. What a blessed assurance. Not only to be able to call upon Him with my lips, what a privilege to be able to do that to call on the God of this universe, not just the God of the Christian, but the God of the dead and the God of the living, to call upon Him. But better than that, the Bible said He knows my thoughts. You could cut my tongue out today and never stop me from talking to God. He knows my thoughts. He knows before I even speak them what they are and what it is that I have need of. Let's refresh our memories with the Word of God just for a moment. In Matthew chapter 7 and verse 7, the Scripture says, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. Matthew 21 and verse 22, And all things whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, believing ye shall receive. John chapter 11 and verse 22. But I know that even now, whatsoever thou wilt ask of God, God will give it to you. John 14 and 13. And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do that the Father may be glorified in the Son. In John 14 and 14, Jesus said, If ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. In John 16, 24, Hitherto have you asked nothing in my name. Ask, and ye shall receive, that your joy may be full. I wish somebody would get happy in this place. You can stop somebody physically in many different ways, but I can still call on God in my thoughts. You can be anywhere and talk to God. 
You can be at work. You can be at home. You can be at Walmart. You can be at J.C. Penney's. You can be anywhere you want to be. And we've been given the privilege and the honor to call on the name of God. Young people, you can be at school. You can be in a classroom. You can be around the flagpole. It doesn't make any difference where you are. All of these scriptures define that if we call upon the name of the Lord, He'll hear us. He knows all about us. He sees the circumstance. And help is on the way. Ask. Shout, yeah. Shout that with me. Ask. Shout it. God tells Solomon, go ahead and ask me for something. What do you want? I love this. I thought to myself, if I'm going to entitle this, I'm going to entitle it, ask me something. Go ahead and ask me something. Ask me anything. You know, sometimes the devil lies to us and says, God don't want to hear you. God knows what's, what's, what it's all about and you just might as well not even ask him. Man, I get mad when I hear the devil do that. Hello. I know people today that won't even go to church, that won't even pray anymore, because somebody has convinced them that God doesn't care about their situation anymore. Hello. He's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. He will never leave you nor forsake you. I'm telling you that you're somewhere in your life circumstances where you've never been before. We've been in positions that we never thought that we would be in. I've had people come into my office and talk to me, talk to me about things that I never dreamt would ever be talked about in the church. How did this episode ever get into the church? How did this take place? Brother, I'm telling you something. You better know God and have enough of God when somebody comes to you with circumstances. Hello. I, I, I'm almost embarrassed to the, some of the situations that come in the office. Things that people talk about that they've been involved with and things that they're doing. But I've had all kinds of it. I've had types where parents come in weeping and sobbing because their children are involved in things they never dreamt they would be involved in. Almost mafia set situations. Gangs after them, ready to kill them for what they owe them. And the parents sit in my op office and sob, having no idea what to do, which way to go. Their children going into their bank accounts, taking, withdrawing thousands of dollars to try to steal from their parents and grandparents and relatives, trying to get out of their situation that they're in. Single moms coming in saying, I don't know what to do. I don't know how to handle this girl anymore. There's no daddy around to take the responsibility to help raise this kid. What do I do? God, help us in the church of God today. Finding ourselves in a position where we never dreamt we would be before. I want to tell you something. If you've never been down some of the roads I'm talking about, you better thank God like you've never thanked Him. It's a different story when that mama who has raised her family and all of her children are gathered around her and all of her grandchildren are standing there they lower that man's body in the ground that she had been with all of those years and got to where she is today because of him. And she's now have to say goodbye and has no idea how many, many years that she'll have to go without it, knowing there's no one else to talk to. She's in a position that she's never been in before, but by the grace of God, Solomon taught us all we have to do is pray for wisdom and ask God to help us to get through this. When we buried my daddy, the first words out of my mama's mouth a couple of days later after the burial 
all the family was still gathered around and we had a big dinner prepared and we walked in and we called mama into the room and said mom it's time to eat and she walked into the room and she looked around and the first thing she said where's your daddy forgotten that quick 55 years of marriage it's hard to forget about something like that I've never had the pain of lowering a casket with my children in it but I've been with families that have been down that road I didn't know how to help them but God knew how to help them God knew how just to do it he knew how to breathe the peace and comfort on them and send the right person at the right time to help them get there we've got children afraid to talk to their parents because they're in a position they've never been in before they're scared to death they're in trouble and they don't know how to approach you and they're afraid they're gonna maybe wind up with an old Pentecostal slap in the head and all they need is some help and understanding because can I just pause here and remind you that we've all made mistakes Kids, teenagers, you, you do not want to even know the mistakes your grandparents made. And you don't even want to know the mistakes your parents made. We're all guilty. None holy, none righteous, only Jesus. So the Lord says to Solomon, ask for something. And right away, he goes into his heritage. The first thing he says, he says, Lord, you have been so good to my father, David. I've seen your goodness bestowed upon my dad. You've showed him great mercy and kindness in his life, even through his lustful affair with my mother Bathsheba. God, you've been good to him. And you have made me a king instead of my father, David, and I have... I'm but just a child in this position. I have no idea what to do. I don't know how to go in. I don't even know how to go out. I don't know how to do anything, Lord. Even when I was a son, I wasn't sure. I was a husband, and I don't know what I'm doing. I'm a father and a leader, and I don't know what I'm doing. So if I ask for anything, I'm going to ask you for help. Give me wisdom and understanding to know what I'm doing when I'm in a position I've never been in before. Help me understand, he says, what the devil is trying to do in my life and in the life of my family and give me the wisdom and the ability to stop this thief who has come in to take away the peace and joy in my life. My God. Solomon said, Lord, I'm reminded how you have given me a people that I can't even number there are so many here. So let me praise you for your goodness to me. I know that I could ask you for anything. I could ask him for riches. I could ask him for more wealth. I could find anything that I could ask God for as far as wealth and materialism and everything that I could have. I could have my pockets running over with money. But you know what I believe Solomon believed in his spirit? I believe that he said to himself, I could ask for riches, but I would run out. I would run out of money before too long. I believe that. I could ask for money and riches, but that runs out. So he said, show me thy ways and how to do things and I will never run out of good things as long as you show me how to do things. Am I helping anybody today? God said to Solomon, since you did not ask me for long life or wealth or power or even to kill your enemies. How many has ever been there? <coughs> oh yeah, y'all holy, aren't you? I've asked the Lord to kill a lot of people in my day, and I'm not ashamed to say it. I say, Lord, just take them out. It'll help everybody. Amen? My son, Charlie, reminded me the other day. He said, Dad, he said, people are like clouds. 
when they leave, some of them, when they leave, things get brighter. Amen. That's true. Don't look at the neighbor you're sitting by next time. Now's a bad time to look at that person. Don't look at it. God said to Solomon, since you did not ask me for long life or wealth or power to kill your enemies, but an unselfish thing such as wisdom, understanding. Verse 13, I will give you what you did not ask for. Ooh, hallelujah. I'll not only give you the wisdom, but I'll give you the wealth. I'll give you the open heavens, and I'll destroy your enemies. Verse 15, and all of this was done in a dream. Did it work? Yeah. You know the conclusion of the story. The Bible says there's two harlots who both have a child. One harlot lays over on the child and smothers it and dies in her sleep. She takes the dead baby and takes it to the other one and steals the baby that is alive and leaves the dead baby for the other harlot and claims it hers. And when the real mama woke up and saw the dead child, she realized after a while that this was not her child. She takes it to the king, takes it to Solomon, who had just prayed, God, there's times I'm going to be where I've never been before. And I need help to get, get through it. They explain the story. The one harlot explains the story to Solomon and says, she laid on her baby, it died, and now she's trying to steal my baby. And Solomon comes up with a great act of wisdom. You remember the story? He tells his servant, bring me a sword. And we'll cut the baby in half, and you give her half, and you give her half. And the real mother shouted out and said, no, don't kill the baby. Let her have it. And Solomon knew that this was the mama. He said, give her the baby, for she's the real mother. Now that sounds like a simple story. But there are some of you sitting in this church today that you're somewhere where you never dreamt in a million years you'd be. You never thought you'd be sitting in this position in your life. You never thought you would be dealing with this circumstance. And it's almost about to drive you out of your mind. You don't know what to do with that precious daughter or that son. You don't know what's going to happen to your marriage. You don't know how to handle it. You don't know how the family has suffered because there's been a death or a tragedy and everybody's in darkness. They don't know what to do. Can I stop here and tell you the way we did it years ago? Take your burdens to the Lord and leave them there. If you'll trust and never doubt, God will bring you out. Take your burdens to the Lord and leave them there. Your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed. Musicians, would you come? Father, in the name of Jesus. Oh God, I sense the presence of the Lord. Oh God, help us. God, help us. Father, in the name of Jesus. Touch that young person, touch that mom and dad, touch that man and that woman. Touch the God, that grandmother who is facing something they've never faced before. Lord, nobody even knows about it. I feel in my spirit right now there's somebody here. You're going through something that you've never told anybody about it yet. It's not even, it's not even news to anybody yet, only, only you. God has brought you here today to remind you to ask him. Precious Lord, take my hand. Lead me on 
let me stand, for I'm tired, I'm weak, I'm worn. Through the storms, through the night, lead me on to the light. Take my hand, precious Lord, <laughs> and lead me on. Let's stand together, let's stand together. Oh, hallelujah. If you're here this morning and you're one of many that's in the position. I would like to stop and apologize and say I'm sorry that if you were expecting a little bit more foot stomping and spitting and hollering and entertainment, but I just did what God told me to do today. You're somewhere where you've never been before, and you need God's wisdom to get through it. Can you come and stand and let's fill this altar and just ask God to give us the wisdom to do it. Come on, Grandma. Come on, Mom and Dad. Come on, young people. Let's sing it one time. Oh, precious Lord, take my hand. Oh, lead me on. Let me stand. I am tired. I am weak. I am old. Oh, through the storm, through the night, lead me on ah, to the light. Oh, take my hand, precious Lord, lead me on. Come on, prayer warriors, come and stand with these folks that are coming. Lay your hands on them and just ask God to touch them. Hallelujah. Preacher, I'm somewhere where I've never been before. I'm dealing with something that I have no idea how I'm going to get through it. So I'm going to ask God for wisdom. I'm going to ask God for understanding. And the God that I serve will make a way <laughs> where there is no way. Come on, somebody. Lift your hands and believe it. <laughs>